check, 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 check one. I unmuted myself. Say if that works. No, it'll just be me. Good morning, and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Tecumseh. I will be your lay reader this morning. My name is Jim Hammond, and I'm just so happy to be here with all of you. You want to join me in the call to worship, please? Welcome, honored guests. Oh, right. Sorry, old school. During the interim, uh, I would encourage you to find the friendship pad in your pew and sign that and pass it along, if you would, please. Okay. Welcome, honored guests. Welcome, siblings and friends. We gather as a community to be reminded and to be reminded of let us worship God. Okay, please stand if you can or wish to and join us in the first hymn number 684.
Again, welcome to worship. We welcome you who are also joining us by your home worship spaces. Welcome to our gathering to glorify the name of God together. Today is All Saints Day, celebrated around the world. It is when we remember uh, those living and dead saints gathered under the cross together of Christ. And in the Reformed tradition, it's not just those who have been actually sainted. It is a priesthood of all believers. So we are all saints. We are all God's holy chosen people. And we remember those who have lived before us, who have entered the church triumphant and are with us today. You will hear more uh, directly about that as we come to the table together uh, for communion today, All Saints Day. My mother died in 2018, All Saints Day weekend. So it was November 4th, and I was right here with you. And I uh, remember that Matt Meinke, our general presbyter, lifted my mom's name that day, and she had just died that morning. So it was a special time, and it remains a special weekend for me. As we come to a time of offering and a time of expressing our gratitude and our generosity, we will offer both uh, the fruit of our labor and our lives and an offering of music. Today we do ex begin to explore a new discipleship practice. It's called cross borders. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. For purposes of this practice, borders are defined as points of separation, the line that separates us from them or you from me, or me from my truer self. To follow Jesus, we are called to move into new territories of greater wholeness. The author of our anthem this morning is John Bell. He's from the Iona community in Scotland. And in this song, John Bell asks 13 questions about crossing borders. I passed all 13 out this morning in the adult education class for people to be able to have and to reflect on these questions. And I'll post them on the Facebook page also later today so that, because we, we, we sing them pretty quickly, but it's really, um, they're so beautiful, these questions. Will you come and follow me? Will you go where you don't know? Will you let me answer prayer in you? and you and me. This song is called The Summons.
Let's rise in body or spirit and sing together hymn number 606, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Please join me in prayer. God, we offer these gifts to you as a token of our gratitude for all that you are and all that you call us to be. Your summons echoes true if we but call your name and you but call our names that you may answer prayer in us and us in you. We pray for your presence ever in us and through us in this world to which you call us. And may you use these gifts for healing, for hope, for love, in the walls and outside the walls of this place and this time. In Christ we pray, amen. So I invite the children to join me here at the steps this morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Children and youth, teens, young at heart. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Morning, morning. So today we're talking about um, a new practice about crossing these distances between us. And one of the things that, um, that's, that's important in this is leaving our comfort zones. And I want to tell you a story. A week and a half ago, I was on a retreat and I was offered an opportunity to eat a food that I had never eaten before. It was in Virginia and it was... Um, pickled watermelon rinds. Now, I just want to ask you, yeah, that's what I, I was like, pickled watermelon rinds? But see, I was a, around a number of people from Virginia, and they said, oh, yes, this, we love this. We do this every summer. We love this. This is so good. How many of you have had pickled watermelon rinds? Okay, some, some people. Anybody else? Look at how many people. That was a lot of people, I thought, that have had this. So I thought, okay, so what we do at our house when we eat watermelons is we eat down to the rind and we give the rind to the chickens. We don't eat the rinds, but they take the rinds and they chop them into little pieces and they pickle them, and that becomes something that they serve, right? So I said, all right, I'll try it. So I tried it. And you know what? It was really good. And you know what else? The people at my table who were part of this group of people that love this, they were so delighted when I tried it, and they were so delighted when I liked it. And there was a way in which that kind of, you know, connected us. So have you ever done that? Have you ever been offered some kind of a food that you're at somebody's house and they offer you a food and this is a family favorite, but it, you've never had this before? Tell me about that. Say something about that. What? Peppers. Like stuffed peppers? Just peppers in general? And yeah, and, and that's right. So then if somebody offers you peppers, or even if you get like so hot, like Hungarian peppers or, you know, something like that, you know, what do you do? Right. So sometimes we can, we can draw closer to each other when we try a food that's important to somebody new to us. So there are some other ways that you can actually cross that difference, that divide between us. Um, maybe you go to a house you've never been to, a new friend, and, and you're meeting their family, and maybe they come to your house for the first time. You guys, when you go to your classes, you're going to talk about different ways that we leave the things that are comfortable to us, and we begin to meet someone new. We begin to meet a different way of being. And there's actually something about learning the love of Jesus in that crossing that you're gonna talk about this morning and we're gonna talk about too. So um, I'm gonna, we're gonna to pray together and then we're gonna you know, kind of bless you out of here to go and learn more about what it is to, to meet different people and learn different things in the name of Jesus. So let's pray. God, we are grateful that you nudge us con constantly out of our comfort zones to learn and to grow in compassion and love to, to see the love of Christ expressed by others, to receive it, and to give it. And so we pray for these young people and for us as we are here in this room, 
and in our worship spaces that we will learn a little bit about other people, other stories, other hearts you would have us open to this day. Amen. <laughs> They're on the move, yeah. Well, if you were uh, closely watching the kids as I was, you just know they were wondering about something, right? And I know what they were wondering about, and so do you. What were they pickled in? Okay, please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, hear us as we confess our fears to you. We're afraid of the unknown, afraid of what is beyond our control, afraid of what is strange to us. And we know fear stops us in our tracks, hinders our action, and gives excuse for not doing what you call us to do and what you empower us to do. We pray, give us courage, O oh God, give us strong hearts and open hands, that we might set aside our fear and walk with courage beyond our doorsteps and into the wide world where you call us to love. Friends in Christ, hear this good news. God is with us in all times and all places. God forgives us and frees us to step out to love, to serve. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Will you turn to one another, again, mindful of oh, flu season and all kinds of other things, offer a gesture of peace and love across the room, across the aisle, down the way. Peace be with you. Okay, the first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis. 12th chapter, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old, and when he departed from Haran, Abram took his wife Sarah and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered. And the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set both to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem in the Oak of Manor. At the time of the Canaanites were in the land, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country and on the east side of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on past stages toward the Negev. Our 
Our second reading this morning comes from the 11th chapter of Acts. I'm just reading verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and to not make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who's called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? Well, when they heard this, they were silenced and they praised God, saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Wandering is in our ancestral spiritual DNA. Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house, and go to the land I will show you, the Lord said to Abraham. Leave all that defines you, all that grounds you. Leave the known and journey into the unknown. And because Abram did that, because he said yes, we have this shared and inherited spiritual identity. A wandering Aramean was our ancestor. Peregrination, the word of the day. Peregrination is in our nature and is our destiny as Christians. It comes from the Latin word peregrinus, meaning foreigner, alien, one from another land, one whose citizenship is other than where one is. Like the peregrine falcon, known as the pilgrim falcon, actually in the Middle Ages. The peregrine falcon can nest from the Arctic to the tropics and is found almost anywhere in the world. We are to be peregrinators, wanderers. It's implied in our name, followers of the way of Jesus, followers, not sit and stayers. Come and see, Jesus said. And he is not a destination. He is a way, a path, a road. Peregrinatio pro amore Christi, Celtic Christians call it, journey for the love of Christ. So that's how I would like to frame this practice that we're studying for the next four weeks together. A peregrinatio por pro amore Christi, or as some say, peregrinatio pro amore Dei, journey for the love of God. So over the next four weeks through education, and the children are doing the same practice, each of these practices they do from little all the way up to adult, education and worship, we will be looking at this practice. We'll look at leaving our comfort zones, 
embracing relationships, challenging exclusion, speaking a new God's language of love. This would be a good practice to study together anytime, but it feels critically important to journey into the world of other people at this time with an open heart. On October 7th, you all know Hamas launched a deadly assault of terrorism against Israel, and every day since, the world has watched in horror as violence begets violence. And not just over there. In our own country, we see a resurgence of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and these are expressions of a broader xenophobia, fear of the stranger, fear of the other, fear of them. I read a blog post from a rabbi in California recently. It was entitled, Letter to My Non-Jewish Friends. I'm just going to share an excerpt from Rabbi Dr. Bradley Shavit Artson from his letter. Israel mobilized to defend itself, and that conflict has now returned to Gaza and the task of containing Hamas, but at the cost of the suffering of enormous numbers of Palestinian civilians. The anguish and the pain is unbelievable. In this time, I know that I am not the only Jew who has felt existentially cut off from humanity. Too many friends and allies were silent, offering no consolation, no condemnation of terrorist assault on civilians. We've watched as other people post the same cheerful pictures of vacations, books they've read, and meals eaten while we are grieving in shock, mourning, and terrified. It feels as though there are two separate worlds, and I've been consigned to one of them while you, dear friends, are still living large. So let me share a bit about this world to which I find myself consigned. Going to work, you park your car, you enter a building, you walk in, you do your job. No checkpoints. No metal detectors. No armed guards opening your bag. I, on the other hand, work in a Jewish institution. When I show up for work, I drive up to a gated campus that now has only one point of entrance. There's an armed guard at that gate who checks everyone before letting them proceed. Apparently, I work in a cage. On weekends, when I pray with my congregation, I approach a building that is also protected by a gate with a single entrance and armed guards at the front. They check every bag of every person who enters, the bag that contains my prayer book and my prayer shawl. I've been with you in your houses of worship. When you congregate, you just park and you walk into the building. Nobody checks your bags. By the way, I'm aware that in this regard, my Muslim friends and I are in the same boat. We both pray in a cage. This letter goes on with other examples, and it ends with this. I just want you to know that. My loneliness will be mitigated as it has been so often by your love and care, but also by your understanding and by your seeing. I am a person and I am a Jew. I spoke with a Jewish friend from college yesterday. He's currently living in Dubai. And he says he's pretty sure he feels safer there than he would if he were living here right now. Poet and author Mark Nepo cautions us against teaching before learning and leaving before staying. In general, what he's encouraging is that we, before reacting, we reflect. I've realized in these last few weeks that I've gotten too comfortable with the limited narratives that I've learned as it relates to the extraordinarily painful and complex realities of the land promised to the offspring of Abraham. So I've begun listening to podcasts of different voices, sharing heartbreaks I didn't know. I had never heard. Erwin Keller describes himself as a rabbi, a teacher, a writer, and a hope monger. <laughs> he also lives in California, and he wrote this poem of lament on October 17th. 
Today, I'm taking sides. I am taking the side of peace. Peace which I will not abandon, even when its voice is drowned out by hurt and hatred, bitterness of loss, cries of right and wrong. I am taking the side of peace, whose name has barely been spoken in this winnerless war. I will hold peace in my arms and share my body's breath, lest peace be added to the body count. I will call for de-escalation even when I want nothing more than to get even. I will do it in the service of peace. I will make a clearing in the overgrown thicket of cause and effect so peace can breathe for a minute and reach for the sky. I will do what I must to save the life of peace. I will breathe through tears. I will swallow pride. I will bite my tongue. I will offer love without testing for deservingness. So don't ask me to wave a flag today unless it is the flag of peace. Don't ask me to sing an anthem unless it is a song of peace. Don't ask me to take sides unless it is the side of peace. His Shabbat reflection showed up in my email yesterday. It's entitled, In the Ruins. So he wrote this 18 days after that poem. In it, he shared a story from the Talmud, and the Talmud is a, a collection of ancient rabbinic teachings. In this story, a rabbi is visiting Jerusalem and ducks inside a ruined building to pray. While he is praying, he is aware he's being watched by the prophet Elijah. After he's done praying, Elijah scolds him for praying while huddled inside a ruined building. You should have prayed on the road, the prophet said. And Keller, the one who wrote that prayer about peace, Keller, in his reflection in the ruins, says he wonders if the sages weren't encouraging us not to linger in the places of our pain warning us out of the spiritual dangers of fetishizing our traumas or being trapped in it and blinded by it. Don't reside too long in the memories of destruction. But then Elijah asked the rabbi, what did you hear while you were praying in the ruins? And the rabbi said he heard a heavenly voice cooing like a dove saying, Alas for my children, because of whose sins I destroyed my house and sent them into exile. It was there in the ruins that he heard the lament of God. And that reminded me of a sermon I read last week, preached by a Lutheran pastor at the Christmas church, Lutheran church in Bethlehem on October 22nd. And this was just after the bombing of the Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza that killed 18, injured many others, and displaced the 600 people who were there seeking shelter in the Orthodox Church in Gaza. This sermon, it was preached by Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac, and it was called God is Under the Rubble in Gaza. This is just an excerpt. Beloved, in these difficult times, let us comfort ourselves with God's presence amid pain and even amid death. For Jesus is no stranger to pain, arrest, torture, and death. He walks with us in our pain. God is under the rubble in Gaza. He is with the frightened and the refugees. He is in the operating room. And this is our consolation. He walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. If we want to pray, my prayer is that those who are suffering will feel this healing and comforting presence. And we have another comfort, which is the resurrection. If there is no place for the children of Palestine and the children of Gaza in this cruel and oppressive world, then they have a place in the arms of God. Theirs is the kingdom. In the face of bombing, displacement, and death, Jesus calls them, come to me, you who are blessed in my Father. Let the children come to me, for theirs is the kingdom. This is our faith. This is our consolation in our pain. I was on a short Celtic spirituality retreat recently that taught us to listen deeply 
with a hand on our hearts. Listen deeply to the heart of the other. Listen deeply to the heart of the earth. Listen deeply to your own heart for the voice of God. That's a peregrinatio. It's a sacred journey. Without the silence and the deep meditative listening in Joppa that day, Peter up on the roof, he would not have seen the image of a new way forward and would not have heard the voice say what God has made clean. You must not call profane. It was only in the silence of deep listening that Peter was able to set aside his attachments to tradition, his dualities, and to what he had comfortably known to be true his whole life and prepare for his peregrinatio pro amore Christi. Taking that inward journey enabled Peter to speak in a new way about God's love, a way that includes you and me. Faith begins by letting go, we sang in our opening hymn, giving up what had seemed sure. Pilgrimage, both night, both right and odd. Leaving our comfort zones. Seems like that's gotten harder since the pandemic began to leave our comfort zones. What's become overly comfortable for you? What convictions, traditions, biases, prejudices, or fears have become convenient to hold on to or to hide behind? Are you praying in the ruins and need to get back out on the road? Is this a time to go up to the rooftop, to find a quiet place above the noise, to put a hand on your heart and say, I am listening? The journey for the love of Christ compels us. What next steps will you take? Let's remain seated and sing together a hymn of preparation uh, for our time together at the table of our Lord. We gather here in Jesus' name. It's 510. Let's sing it as a prayer.
share an invitation to the table from the Iona community. Heaven is here and earth and the space is thin between them. Distance may divide, but Christ unites those bounded by time, those blessed for eternity. Heaven is here and earth and the church above and below is one. Peter is here and Paul and James and John and Andrew and Martha and all the Marys, the saints from far back and those who left us not long ago and only sight prevents us from seeing them one with us on the other side. Heaven is here and earth and the God who made them is present. The lamb glorious on the throne sits beside us. The spirit of God, the dove makes her resting place among us. God inhales our prayers and spreads a table for us to come and in our hunger to be fed, in our weakness to be strengthened for our heavy hearts receive grace. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to our God forever and ever. Please join me in prayer. Thanks and praise to you, O God, creator and lover of the universe. You created all that was, you nurture all that is, you imagine all that will be. You are the pattern of community, three in one, God of mercy. From the beginning of time, you've created us for relationship with one another, with the earth and with you. When we reject your call to community, choosing isolation over partnership and brokenness over healing, you call us back again and again with words of grace and the promise of new life. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our host and our guest at this table. Through his birth, you took on flesh affirming the goodness of our bodies and our world. Through his life, you took on suffering, sharing the truth of hope in desperation. Through his death, you took on death, re revealing the depth of your love for us. Through his resurrection, you brought new creation, embodying the promise of life everlasting. So with thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup, gifts of the earth, through which you bless us and we offer ourselves in your service. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, O God, and upon these gifts of fruit and grain, that we may taste your goodness, that we may see your presence, and we may become one with you and your body, gathered at your table. We join all your saints who have gone on before us, and we remember them here. In life and in death, we belong to you our Alpha and Omega, all thanks and praise to you, O God, holy, three in one, now and forever. Hear us as we join our voices and our hearts in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Abba, who art in heaven. When we come to the table of our Lord, we remember that as the host of the meal, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and he offered it to his friends around the table saying to them, this is my body broken and given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Every time we come to this table, the Lord's table, we remember, we remember those words. We remember that heart. We remember the ministry of Christ, the love of Christ, the compassion ever flowing of Christ. We sing about it. We say words about it. And we feel it deep within us every time we come to this table. 
this table that is shared in so many parts of the world. And so these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We do serve communion here by coming forward. And there is a plate of gluten-free bread in the center with a cup of juice on either side. So as you come forward, you are invited to take a piece of the bread, to dip it into a cup on either side, and then return to your seats.
This time, let us open our hearts toward one another in the sharing of joys and concerns and other prayer requests you have on your heart as we pray for the church, pray for the people, and lift up our prayers for one another to hold and lift into the light of God. Henry has the microphone. If you have something that you would like to share this morning, I invite you to speak directly right into the microphone, introduce yourself, and then uh, what you would like to lift in prayer. Hello, this is, I'm Christine Obide. Um, I just have a couple of joys. My daughter's doing much better, so I just wanted to thank you again for all the lovely prayers and cards and everything. Thank you so much. Um, the other joy is um, for those of you who um, would be interested, the art department at Tecumseh High School and the music department are planning a Veterans Day event in the sculpture garden. Everyone's welcome. Um, they're going to do a little show and they've got some art that they want to display. So if you feel like you're available Friday at, I think it's 1.30 at the Sculpture Garden. So we'd love to see you there. Thanks. God, we continue to lift Chloe to you for your healing care and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hi, I'm Marilyn Baena and um, I think a lot of you have already read a little email about Ramon, the man we were going to sponsor from Venezuela. Um, but I heard from him this week, and he said he was being moved. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what would happen. And I really struggled as to what to say, and all I could say is, I know God will be with you. I know God will go with you. And he said, Amen. And right now, as of this morning, he was in a transfer station in Louisiana. His lawyer, Sister Attracta, believes that he will probably be deported. Uh, my son, Andy, who works for a human rights group, said it's right by Miami where the planes leave from. And Sister Attracta was expressing her lament that we're sending plane load after plane load of people back to Venezuela after we declared that their government was so dangerous that they should have temporary protected status if they arrived before July 31st. And unfortunately, Ramon arrived the first week of August. Uh, so I'm just praying that God will be with him, protect him, and um, that he'll soon be reunited with his family and not be imprisoned. I, I hope he won't be put in prison as he feared, and that um, violence won't beget violence, as Kathy was talking about. Um, the situation there isn't good either. And we pray so much for peace in our world and for uh, human rights of every citizen of every people group. Um, we pray for the Palestinians and for the Israelis and for the Venezuelans and for each of us that Christ would give us hope in our hearts. Um, I'm also praying that God will show us the way forward if, if God would have us uh, sponsor some other refugee from some other place or from Latin America, some asylum seeker, some refugee, or whether we open our hearts to the people in our community and, and help those in need who are very close to us. And I just thank you all for being so willing and so open-hearted and uh, the hands and feet of Christ. So thank you all. Marilyn asked about the items that have been collected for Ramon and she was so grateful for the generosity of everyone. And I just said, Marilyn, wait, we're, we're gonna wait. We're going to wait on the way that God will direct us because we're very clear that we've been called onto this path for some reason. But oftentimes, and I just read this in Mark Nepo's devotion this morning, oftentimes our plans are not the plans that come to be, right? They are other, they direct us in other ways. So we think it's going one way and God actually has a different plan in mind. So we wait, we wait with attentiveness to see what God will do. And for Ramon, we pray, oh God, for your safe care and keeping, 
for your grace to be with him and all of the others who will accompany him on the plane back for all the others who are going back into precisely what they fled from for fear that you will journey with them you will comfort them and give them hope in these desperate times lord in your mercy hear our prayers hi i'm kate i <laughs> I'm just seeing the love and grace and kindness of all the people in this church, and I just want to share that because it makes me feel so loved. Thank you. And welcome, Joel. Good morning. I'm Julie Herman. Um, I just want to mention to you the joys that I have shared with several people here in uh, visiting Tecumseh Place. Um, the people that attend and make these residents feel loved is just incredible. We had a breakthrough um, when we were there a week ago, and uh, most of the people in the second building have dementia. And uh, we have one lady who's non-communicative, and uh, we sing hymns and they listen. Well, the breakthrough was from another resident. They asked if Sandy could play um, This Little Light of Mine. So Sandy impromptu started playing that. And we started doing the um, actions to it that we learned when we were small children. And this non-communicative resident broke out in this huge smile and she started doing the motions, remembering what a, what a beautiful breakthrough moment that was. She just made all of our hearts feel so good. And Nancy said, let's continue with the children's hymns. So if anybody has the piano music to the children's hymns, any of them, if you could contact me um, we want to share that with the residents. We want to meet them where they're at, and they're in their childhood, and that's okay. Those are beautiful memories. The other thing that happened that same day, um, it was a very cold day on our visit, as Luann knows, and uh, many of the residents were very cold, and Nancy said, why don't we share our shawls with them? And I said, that's a great idea. I've, I've never shared a shawl that we've made, but I know from the ladies that have started the shawl ministry, that's what they're there for, and they're there, they're being made to extend the love of this church community to others. And if you've never shared a shawl, which I hadn't, I've made them, but we don't make them for things. I took them back and put them across four of the residents' shoulders, and the emotion that they had was like, I had just embraced them with so much love. So thank you to everybody that um, supports the Shaw ministry and also the visitation. This, um, I'm Luann and just to add to that is my mother had dementia for 10 years and, and I think I had encourage all of you who are dealing with somebody with dementia, remember their brains are still working. They just can't bring it out. You don't sit there and say, gosh, does mom look like heck today? Uh, you know, and thinking they can't hear. They hear everything. And my mother-in-law, when I said, we're all here and we love you, a tear just went down her, her cheek. So I encourage all of you, if you want to join us, to join us. And if not, if you have someone in your, your family or your neighborhood that has dementia, remember their brains are still working. We just have to get there. And the breakthrough was a sign of that. Thank you to both of you for sharing that. That's a beautiful illustration of the journey for the love of Christ. And um, we have talked along the way about coming out of our comfort zones to be in this place, in that place. And it's hard. It's hard work when you're sitting with someone who doesn't have the ability to communicate. But thank you so much for that beautiful way of crossing borders and making that connection with love. Oh, hi, I'm Mary Glidden, 
And I'd like prayers for my neighbor. His name is Pat Lawrence. And he transports people to medical appointments. And on his uh, transport last week, uh, the woman was getting dialysis and her drunk boyfriend uh, got really angry and uh, attacked my neighbor. And uh, he spent three days in the hospital. He's partially paralyzed on the face. He's knocked his teeth out, his jaw's broken. Um, so he's going to have a long recovery. So his name is Pat Lawrence. So please pray for him. Did you say his name is Pat, Mary? Yes, Pat Lawrence. God, for Pat, who in his compassionate work and his open-hearted work in transporting people to medical appointments has faced this difficult portion of his journey, we pray for your healing, we pray for your love to be in all and through all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for Pat. I'm Kathy Johnson Payne, and I'm asking that we pray for Reverend Dr. Anne Marie Montgomery. She's the pastor of Cadmus Presbyterian Church, and she's currently receiving um, treatment, chemo, and such for breast cancer that has returned. Thank you. We lift to you, O oh God, Anne Marie, our sister, our colleague, our friend, pastor to so many. We pray for your grace to be upon her as well, for your healing touch to be upon her, that this journey may be filled with your presence and your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Um, I know the apple lumpkin is in all of our rear view mirrors, but I just wanted to offer a sincere thanks uh, to all those who worked to park cars uh, on Saturday and Sunday during the Apple Lumpkin. Saturday was not much fun. It was <laughs> not a very nice day. But over the two days, I think we took in around $2,200 or $2,300. And that is in support of three uh, charities, uh, Catherine Cobb, Share the Warmth, and Tecumseh Service Club. So I think we served a need within the community and had a little fun doing it and helped three organizations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Let's arise and body your spirit to sing our final hymn. It's Lord, we have come to the lakeshore. It's reminiscent of the Sea of Galilee and the calling of Jesus' disciples. It's 721. Lord, we've come to the lakeshore.
Good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Andrew Stewart. I'm one of the deacons here, and we've been doing these uh, almost weekly deacons minutes to keep everybody updated of all the goings on around here. Um, we got a really important one coming up next Sunday is our trivia afternoon. Um, we are doing that at 4 p.m., uh, for about 4 to 6, I think it'll run, and it should be a lot of fun right here in Knox Hall. So please tell your friends, bring your team, um, make a team with some new friends when you get here if you need to. Um, it's a $10 uh, donation to join. And then we also uh, have a very empty sign-up list for potluck donations. Now, it doesn't need to be fancy. You can go run to the store and buy a tray of rolls or a couple bags of chips or something. But if you would, please come see me uh, after the service if you're able and willing to help out with that. Uh, we also have the Share the Warmth dinner coming up the following Saturday, which is November 18th, so not this coming week, but the one after that, and I noticed that there's nobody signed up for that yet either, so please, uh, if you have some time available, um, we have split it up so that we have two or three people doing the main dish, so it's not so much work for any one person to do, and the same with the sides and the desserts. Um, that sign-up sheet's on the deacon board in the hallway as usual. I also want to give a big thank you for the uh, food donations for Tecumseh Service Club that you see out in the hallway there. Uh, we'll be coordinating in the next week or two to get those all picked up and get them to the places that they are needed. Um, but I was really um, pleasantly surprised when I walked in today because I wasn't here last week and that place, that, that area that we're collecting has like tripled in the last couple of weeks. So thank you for that. Um, also a reminder about directory photos. It's not too late. If you haven't got your picture taken yet, we will still make sure that you can get that done. So uh, as always, come see me or one of the other deacons if you have any questions. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all next Sunday um, for service and also for trivia. Thank you. I invite you to please rise one more time and body your spirit for the, for the charge and the benediction. Let us go into the world with open hearts, with open arms, with open minds, trusting that God will show us what we need to see, confident that God is always with us, and may the blessings of our God who called Abram and Sarai to leave, who called Moses to lead, who called disciples like you and like me to follow, may the blessings of our God go with us all now and forever. Amen.
have a, have a, have a quick lunch or something, huh? Where'd my guy go? <laughs> <laughs> 